was mature until it molted again. And with that, you just do it. It'll turn out okay. Everyone, it's me, Brainbug, and Jackson had to, had, had to, had to use the potty. <laughs> Sorry, what, what a weird way for to start that. I, I was sitting here talking about the uh, <laughs> my praying mantis here because I thought it was a I thought it was an adult female, and now it molted out and has and it has these gorgeous wings. Um, and actually, I look like it looks like it didn't have quite enough space to spread its wings out uh, when it was molting. So there's a little bit of deformity on the end there. Oh, but you live and learn. Hopefully, it it still completes its life cycle. How you doing tonight, Bandia? Nineteen ninety eight. I am good. I spent the few last few hours playing a game, waiting for this to start. <laughs> Mm. Oh. Jackson had to uh, step out for a second. We're going to be talking about the Carboniferous today. Yep. Be... And since Carboniferous is known for gi yeah. giant insects, I figured, you know, why not call the expert of insects <laughs> that I know? Well, I try. Yeah, I, I do. I do love me some insects. So, uh, and uh, arthropods of all kinds. Uh, the Carboniferous had some great uh, early uh, spiders, like uh, stem, well, I shouldn't say spiders, stem arachnids uh, that can be inferred to be the ancestors of spiders uh, and definitely a lot of myriopods. So it could be called called the uh, the age of uh, of of peds too, of centipedes and millipedes, because they really, really rocked it out during that era. Oh, definitely. Oh. Hey, sorry. Do you know if that 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 what's it called that <coughs> <coughs> that giant like millipede and centipede thing was a millipede or a centipede? That giant, very long creature. Arthropleura. Yeah. Uh, yeah, that was a that was a Carboniferous giant. So yes, I, I actually I uh, know quite a bit about that. I was when I was a moderator on this uh, on this forum. I actually uh, used to go by the name Arthropleura because nice. I was such a big fan fanboy of it. Uh, that was in the like early two thousands when there was a lot of debate on on its what kind of uh, uh, where, where basically where it was nested at. So there was a, con some contention and you see that when you watch like walking with monsters, it's kind of behavior and, and, and mannerisms are more reminiscent of like a centipede than, than what you would see oh. in a millipede, which is what it actually turns out that it's not just related to millipedes, it's not just the ancestor to millipedes. What are we talking Arthur about? Flora is a giant millipede. The giant oh, Flora. Hey, Hey, don't give them too many uh, spoilers. Oh, oh, do, do you have slides? Tell me you have some slides. Of course I have slides. He always has slides. You think I would I would come to the party unprepared? That's what I'm talking about. Jackson whips out Hold the on. slides. That's when the party starts. I do have a All map. Right. I don't have any slides, though. So You have a map? Yeah, just a map. <laughs> Is Interesting. Um, can you see my screen? Yes. Yes. So big bugs of the Carboniferous. And I, it's funny I titled this because I was looking for alliteration because RJ always does alliteration. But I mean, most of what we're going to talk about is not, in fact, bugs. And we don't actually in the in the technical sense, we're not going to be talking about any bugs, the Hemipterans. Yeah, bugs weren't involved at all during the Carboniferous, as, as far as we know. Yeah, we're going to talk about insects, which are bugs in the broad sense, unless you're talking about bugs in the really broad sense, which is just like arthropods. But yeah, um, but yeah in the technical sense, there were no no bugs yet. There were no hemipterans yet, or if there were, there weren't any giant ones. So it would have anyway. been very basal, I think. Yeah, but. Go on. Yes, with your slides. You are, yeah, you, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If 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 there's anything you want to add or say at any point, then yeah, just yeah. just. Well, I want to say that uh, during the first half of the uh, of the Carboniferous, there were uh, there's one insect that we know of. So for the very first half of it, there's that insects weren't on the scene yet, and when we and their insects weren't quite as diverse 
uh, during the Carboniferous as they would later become. There's a lot of uh, a lot of homogeny for the body plans during this time. It's very right. the, the the wing uh, the, the the well the Neopterans uh, there weren't hardly any of them, but uh, you have everything looking like a dragonfly basically. Everything <laughs> looks like a dragonfly or a silverfish. <laughs> Right, right, yeah, um, yeah. You you are absolutely correct, and we we will talk about a number of those. Um, but yeah, it's kind of interesting that you have this this um, set of stem groups kind of all appearing right around the same time. Which oh, it's almost like it's a an adaptive radiation or something. Ooh, Ooh. <laughs> like evolution is happening. <laughs> That's Couldn't impossible. Be. Um. So dogs don't produce non-dogs, Jackson. Dogs don't produce non-dogs. These are facts. These are facts. I agree with that. So the prequel to the big bugs of the Carboniferous, um, and it's with natural history, it's kind of hard to find like a single place to start because everything is interconnected. And so just sort of arbitrarily, I decided we'll start with the plants. So um the in a sense, I guess you could say the prequel to the Carboniferous was at the very start of the Devonian, when the uh, when lignified tissues like xylem and phloem first developed in vascular plants, in early vascular plants. So this is at the start of the Devonian. Now, as a which, result, which you, which you can see, talk you can see Jackson talk about in our plant episode. Yes, you can. Yep, we did talk about um, uh, the vascular plants and xylem and phloem and all that fun stuff. Um, so you can kind of see there's a little Devonian scene with low plants there. And yeah, most of those are probably not taller than a person. And so, uh, and before that the plants barely got beyond like the water's edge, they were, been, they would have been in only very low lying areas where it was very damp because I they were like, my glasses go on. I gotta go grab my spectacles. I can't. <laughs> Your spectacle. My... You're going to grab them all. Yeah. You got to be all. All of you gotta do it all three of us are wearing glasses. You're, you're out. You're, you're out of place. Right. Well, watch me hobble away. Um, like an old man. Do, should I go on or should I wait? Go on. I'll, I, I'll catch up. Okay. Um, so the origin or sorry, the development of lignified tissues during this during the Devonian led to evolutionary arms races between dif different developing lineages of vascular plants. So it started an upwards race. Who can tower the highest and get their leaves up so they can do photosynthesis. They can get the necessary materials for making glucose. And this led to not just trees, which I'm using in the, the sense of uh, like the spermatophytes, the gymnosperms, which are the cone producing they, they plants. Were tree, they were tree like, but not true trees that we call today. Yes, exactly. So yeah, the, the angiosperms, which are the, the flowering plants and the gymnosperms, the cone producing plants, those I'm, I'm calling the, those are the, the the trees, but of course there were no gymnosperms yet, and there were no and there were definitely no angiosperms yet. They don't appear until much much later. But there were also lots of things that look like trees, but which weren't trees. They were other types of plants disguised as trees. So um, the the ancestral groups or groups plural um, to the the gymnosperms and angiosperms were called pro gymnosperms. And these were starting to appear in the uh, in the late Devonian, such as Archaeopteris, not to be confused with Archaeopteryx, which is a bird. And Lepidodendron is, it looks like a tree, but it's not a tree. It is a lycopod. So lycopods today are very small plants. Um, they're low to the ground. But back in the Carboniferous, there were some that would tower many meters into the air. They're like 30 plus feet tall. So I have some lycopods. They're gorgeous ornamental plants. A lot of, uh, mm -hmm. uh, they have a lot of waxy leaves that retain moisture. Well, which kind of, is there a reason for that? Them evolving during this period when it was so swampy and them having that waxy finish on their leaves that repels water. I mean, that it may have been an, uh, an adaptation to whatever wetland environment they were originally yeah. evolved in um, that's that would have been my guess i suppose yeah. i'm not i'm not a <laughs> an expert on like right. i like to speculate <laughs> right, so I mean, it's entirely possible yeah sure so so were were the pro 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 pro, pro gymnosperms 
were they laying low right now during this time, like 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 the, like we mammals were during the di- di- dinosaur time? Uh, no, they uh, I, I they were more like it was all these groups sort of evolving upwards at once. Okay. Like it's sort of like the ancestors of you know mammals and the ancestors of dinosaurs, the diapsids and the synapsids and anapsids all kind of having it out in the Permian. It's sort of like this: all these different groups are having it out at once, trying to outcompete each other for okay. space and and resources. Yeah, that that'd be the the best way of thinking about it. Um, Last time that that uh, vertebrates and invertebrates had it out, that was back during like the the cryogenian. Uh, so we were fighting it out on snowball <laughs> Earth. And I'm sure you, I'm not sure, and I'm sure you'll be having it in the future. But this is this is about the. The diapsis and the synapsids. This is about this is when we were all, right now. We were almost the 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 same thing. Uh, well, they were at this time. Yes, in the Devonian, uh, we had yet the the three different lineages had yet to separate of amniotes had yet to separate. So they're still uh, we're still dealing with like just amphibians at this point in terms of tetrapods. There are no no amniotes yet. They wouldn't be until later in the next period towards the end of the Carboniferous. So the that upwards arms race of trees, what that did, as well as the tree likes, um, is this started eroding the soil. Because for the first time, you have plants, which don't just have little rhizomes. They're just kind of sitting there atop the soil. Um, these things are reaching deep into the soil. They're disturbing the, the dirt. Sorry, Steve Bowman, if you're listening. Uh, <laughs> in a way, the soil. In a way that no plants had done before and in doing this whenever it rained this would wash away soil and it would get trans transported in rivers down to the sea and what this would cause are are, uh, algal blooms and this causes what uh, what's known as eutrophication so basically the algae will take over an area Uh, diatoms do that today uh they'll which which can end up uh putting demoic acid in fish and crabs and other things that humans eat. And so it becomes toxic. They also sap the oxygen out of the water. And so this uh, will kill off anything uh, living in their area. It will just suffocate fish drowning literally. Um, And as well as global cooling because erosion takes carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere. And so both the widespread eutrophication and global cooling caused the end Devonian mass extinction, which majorly impacted um, lobe-finned fish and uh, lots of other uh, and, uh, shallow uh, sea animals. So, like the stagnation of the of the water, kind of pushed our ancestors to start breathing air and moving more towards uh, living on land, too. Then, right? Uh, they'd kind of already moved on. They would have probably. So they were hunkered down. I guess you could say they were not super diverse at this time. They'd kind of come on land in about the mid Devonian. And so they were not super diverse by the late Devonian. And then in the Carboniferous, they took off. Yeah. They had a big um, diversification event. But, and so, but yeah. But, yeah. But after this, pretty much after this, except for on, there's only two low fin fish left in the water and, and the rest of species in the water and western around land, the lung fish and, and what will we, what become the lung fish and what will become the uh seal camp. Uh that that may be the case. I'm not entirely sure, not super familiar with um the with Ripidistians, but that could be the case. Uh, that by the by the end of this there were only the lung fish and, and the coelacanths. Do we left. nest coelacanths in tetrapo- tetrapoda? No, it's it's coelacanths, then lungfish, then tetrapoda. Okay, so we consider them as, uh, or they're they're Sarcopterygians. Yeah. Okay. But, yeah. So uh, and then the, we... ray, the ray fin fish had their heyday. Yeah, their, actually, their, they, they had a, they had a big radiation in the Triassic. Interestingly enough, as did the arthropods. They had their um, the mm-hmm. uh, was it the Mesozoic lacustrine revolution? I think was was in the Triassic with the, with so, the flowering plants and. Yeah. Well, that's no. That was the the oh, Cretaceous about terrestrial the revolution. Sorry, yeah, the yeah, okay. Yeah, the, they, you had like diving beetles and all sorts of stuff invading river systems in the Triassic, and they became yeah. very numerous. Uh, but anyways, 
so uh, are we done with this slide? Yeah, yeah, but also, yeah, one second. Also, real fast, this was also when we said goodbye to the the poor placoderms. Yep, yes, well, they yes, they they died off, I think, largely as a result of this, and they went extinct. Uh, I mean, we 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 are placoderms technically, with <laughs> well, yeah, it's a, it's a paraphyletic term because you have oh, they yeah. cover a bunch of different groups yeah. throughout, like the, yeah, the yeah, Ordovician yeah, and Salarian. Yeah, there is a thing now where they people. Uh, hypothesis or theorize whatever it is that placoderms were not a side brand. They were, uh, we were a, a stem group, yeah. That we might be a, a clade from them or something. From the, the placoderms? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Because yeah, placoderms were the first, they, they're the first real jawed animal. Yes. They were the. Had. So, so anything that has a jaw is technically a placoderm. Yeah, so yeah, placoderms, there were like groups of them which became the sharks, groups which became the ray fin fish, groups which became the lobe fin fish. It was just kind of all those basal fish were placoderms and they just went off in a whole bunch of different stuff. People directions. always think of the armored placoderms of the uh, what the late Devonian. Right. Yeah. Right, but right, right. Yeah. It, so. goes, it, it branched a lot further than that, but yeah, let's, let's, what you got next? <laughs> um, so that was the prequel. So the, the prequel was the, the was the, the much lower uh, much lower lying plants of the Devonian, which gave rise as a result of evolutionary arms races to the much larger trees now in the Carboniferous. And so we're dealing at this time with Pangaea, right? Pangaea sort of solidified at the start of the Cambrian and goes all the way to near the end of the Mesozoic, and so. Basically, the entire uh, supercontinent is a forest or a series of rainforests and savannas. And so um, this has some very interesting effects. Uh, one of the major effects was carbon was sequestered from the atmosphere. Because when the plants die, when or when the trees died, which are made of lots and lots of carbon, they just fall over and nothing degrades them. And so they just get buried. And then we and, get polystrate fossils. <laughs> yep. And then we get polystrate fossils. Therefore, evolution is dead. Yep. <laughs> right. <laughs> um, yeah. I think Aaron actually did a really good video talking about um, why polystrate fossils are not a thing recently. But half the time, aren't isn't it, isn't it a lyco a lycopod that you see them put up on the screen when they talk about it? Yeah. So it's not it's not a tree in the in the traditional sense it's one of the yeah it's the the lycopods which yeah you talked about that last slide yeah <laughs> so um so yeah these things would get buried and coal was the result so it turns out that um the end of the coal the super coal producing period which for which the carboniferous is named was due to fungi um developing um uh, chitinases or chitinases and so then when they did that, then something could break down the, what did I say? Not chitinases. Um, well, you're uh, talking about fungi, right? It's chitinases. Uh, no, I mean, yes, for not, but not for them, for breaking down the wood. That's, um, what am I thinking of? Lignin in wood. What is it? What is the, the enzyme that breaks down wood called? Uh, it's what's the what's the uh, termites uh, in their spray that they have. Hold on, uh, let's see. Not chitinases. That's not that's not correct. That's for the arthropods. Is that insect? Is that is that is that little cell thing that starts that starts with an M that lives in their gut? Are you talking about the um, the mixed trica? Yeah. Um, well, I'm trying to think. Of what's the name of the enzyme that mixed trica has? that breaks down the, the lignin and the, it's not like lignase, is it? Cause that would make sense, but I don't think that or lignin. It's a cellulose, right? That they're breaking down. So, so it'd be cellulase. Cellulase. At any rate, you get the point. Fungi yeah. came up with enzymes, which could then break down wood and then no longer was coal being produced at the ridiculous rate that it previously had been. So that's the point. Um, so that's why the that's what the Carboniferous is named for. It's the it's the coal bearing period. Um, but the other effect of there being lots and lots and lots of of 
large plants now is they're producing higher uh, levels of oxygen than it had previously be, been produced in the Devonian. So the I love the, oxygen. That's a, that's a good thing, isn't it? <laughs> yes, oxygen is nice. You know, um, so atmospheric levels of oxygen, which we'll, we'll get back to it, uh, shortly, um, raise tremendously, and so. Raising oxygen levels increases the size limit that organisms can be. So this happened in the in the late Ediacaran. You had a raise in the amount of, of oceanic oxygen concentration, and this allowed for larger things uh, like Anomalocaris and um, Opabinia and all those guys, and they could swim uh, in the pelagic realm. They weren't just restricted to the benthic realm anymore. Uh, and the reason for this is... Oxygen is involved in cellular respiration, so we use it to make the largest amount of cellular energy, which is ATP, adenosine triphosphate. Um, uh, we, we do make a little bit through like glycolysis, uh, which is um, substrate-level phosphorylation, but the biggest, the largest amount of ATP that we make is through oxidative phosphorylation, which occurs in our electron transport chain, which we use oxygen for. So... So more oxygen means things can get bigger because they can make more energy. Which Ness talked about a little bit in last, in last week's episode of photosynthesis. And, and we yes. are going to see, and probably a slide coming up here, the effects on some of the organisms, right? Absolument. Oh, yeah. So here's a, yeah, here's the chart I was referencing. I forgot where I put it. So um, here are the, the here are two different proxies for levels of, of oxygen in the... Um, from the Silurian to the, the end of the Permian. And so what we're looking at is this period where it says about 350 at the top to about where it says uh, 300. So that period is the Carboniferous. And you can see, so the PAL, that's the, the present atmospheric levels. And so it's we're at 21% of our uh, atmospheric content is oxygen. Well, during the at the end of the Carboniferous, it was up to 35%. 35. So... So there was a lot more oxygen. There's also something really interesting that happened as a result. So if you have a lot more oxygen, as well as lots of plants, what's something that you would expect might happen a lot more? What was what, what was the question? Is this going to be on the test? If you have, if you have, you know, a, a much higher concentration of oxygen, and you've got all these plants, what's something you might expect to happen more? Fire? Fire! Exactly! Lots and lots and lots of fires. Yeah. And so... That was a central point on uh, when when walking with, again, walking with beasts went back, or walking with monsters went back to the Carboniferous. Exactly. Yeah. Lots and lots of fires. We're talking like continental scale fires. And so here's one of them. This is from a paper called Fire Ecology of the Carboniferous Tropical Zone. Where um, was Smokey the Bear back then? He was still Smokey the the tetrapod, the early stem tetrapod. <laughs> um, so we have these fire-prone fern communities at the top here. Uh, gymnosperm dominated savanna biomes, and one of the really cool things, which um, or one of the really cool things about paleogeography, is researchers figuring out like where particular um, environmental things took place, like how well they can identify in this instance, where fires were, they were, they occurred predominantly in certain types of environments, but not in others. That's something you don't ever see creationists doing. Oops. Sorry. <laughs> yes. Uh, in, in, you can, that's what people don't uh, seem to grasp about when we find a formation, right? They're like, Oh, you find bones in the ground. No, you find an entire ecology in the ground. Yes. You don't just find, it's not the yes, the big dinosaur is the big show, but there's other things in the environment that we use to date and and to build the environment that these animals lived in, whether it's within their body or in the in the same formation. We yeah. <laughs> yes, you're absolutely correct. Yeah. And so here's another one. This is from the same paper. Um, this is a a Lepidodendrid dominated rainforest. So this, so the, the previous one was savanna uh, biome. This is a rainforest biome, and so the fires are are um, much more rare at the center of the peat 
Pete Myers, a fire prone, a conifer opposite upland forest. I just found this chart very, very interesting that the fires were occurring in particular areas, but not others. And so, I don't know. So that, the that the was dark area is the, the burned area, right? So we're seeing it kind of hugging that yeah, waterway. The, Right, yeah, the, the margins of mires and on channel levees. So were there so, a lot of this yeah. sw like swampy type area on 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 the on the continent right now or is it this in patches? Yeah, there were I mean well there are rainforests and, and swampy areas, but there were also savannas. So there were you know both of these different types of and there were plants everywhere, but like they weren't all rainforests, I guess you could say. And you gotta think you can't think about the swamps, the carboniferous the same way we think about swamps today. You gotta think about okay, right. the bottom you're gonna have, of course, the, the uh sediment, and then you're gonna have the saturated uh deterus, then you're gonna have more free floating deterus, and you're gonna have uh, maybe maybe a, a water column, then a layer of, of foliage, and then more another water column and and different you're gonna have different ecosystems all the way down through it very different than what we see today you, mm -hmm. maybe the closest analog you could do would be like a very dense southeast asian swamp maybe would have uh similar biomes i don't know okay yeah yeah absolutely yeah i'm not sure myself so um so big fires um lots of oxygen and so I had, of course, to talk about the terrestrial vertebrate fauna. Because as we mentioned earlier, the tetrapods were around, but they weren't doing all that well by the end of the Devonian. There were a few here and there, but they weren't super uh, diverse. But at the start of the Carboniferous, there I can hear an echo. I hear an echo on someone's end. I don't know whose it is. I hear my echo, too. Echo? Hello? Maybe well not anymore. Okay. So um so uh tetrapods radiated into a whole bunch of different environments and niches by the start of the Carboniferous. And so I picked just a sampling of them. You have Baggy Herpeton, which is this guy who looks kind of like a crocodile. Then uh, to his right is Ophiderpeton, which looks like a snake, completely lost their legs, just like uh, Sicilians. Armored terrestrial insectivores like Peltobatrachus, which is that guy on the bottom, and then amniote relatives like Eucrita. So that was more closely related to us than it was to any of these other guys. So it was that thing on the bottom. Thing on the bottom. It was that what we would call a, a reptilomorph, like like still laid eggs in the water, but was, but more, it, but uh, so more uh, not quite yet. Uh, Eucrit is getting more towards the reptilian morphs, but we're not quite there yet. But that, if I remember correctly, that's the stuff that's still that's more closely right? that's more closely more closely to us and and yes. amphibians, but not amphibians. Yeah, yeah, that's like the diadectomorphs and the gephyrostegids. Yeah, those are the reptilian morphs. You think that? Or do we are we inferring that that uh, Eucrita that they are laying soft shelled semi permeable eggs still i have no idea what their mm. um ecology was i just know that based on their uh their cranial remains it's most similar to amniotes they okay. may have been laying in soft shell you know terrestrial eggs or they may have still been doing the normal um amphibian thing i i don't Into know the life stages i kind of i was kind of wondered about when our like, when our ancestors stopped going through the the life cycle going through the uh the yeah. tadpole stage outside you know right. it's, 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 like i said from i remember from that from watching the thing this they could trap they could trap they weren't dependent on the water to survive their skin was more watertight like ours are but their babies still needed it well a, a tadpoles have been gained and lost numerous times throughout frog evolution um just in modern um frogs they they exhibit all sorts of different types of parental behavior mm -hmm. and so um i don't know if these guys were doing tadpoles or they were like more direct development i have no idea some species are ovaporous uh with in certain environments and they're and they're not in others so it's it's really uh what's that lizard uh 
it's the one that li- that moves that lives the furthest north of any lizard but up in the northern areas it's it it reproduces uh it gives birth to live young i can't remember what the species is but um, you got me on that one but yeah they uh, you're right um amphibians do uh lots of different ones actually i did a video with prophet of zod not too long ago where we talk about amphibian reproduction um and so we discuss um there are frogs who do direct development so they'll just have the, uh, like uh, i think uh, hemifractus was one of them it's like a little frog and carries the babies on its the little tiny froglets on its back um mm-hmm. some uh carry tadpoles on their back so they'll lay the eggs and the tadpole then they'll guard the tadpoles and then when they hatch the tadpoles will attach to the parent and then they'll hop out of one pond and into another that's um, tree frogs do that don't they there's some species of tree frogs that live in mm-hmm. uh big uh orchids or not orchids what am i i think you're right like they lay them in flowers and stuff yeah yeah Yeah, you're right um and then there are others who there are some who do like um who give live there's only like two species that give live birth but it does happen so frogs are are ridiculously versatile oh there's the one that gives birth out of its mouth too don't forget that one oh um gastrobophus or is it I know what you're Gastro, talking about. Gastroprotrachus, or I don't know. It, it looks like a toad. It's not like a. It's not. Yeah, a pretty, it it's was, Australian though, so of course it is. Yeah, the, the mouth brooding toads. I actually did a video on them a long time ago, um, and then we did we did also talk about them. So yeah, you're right. Um, super weird. <laughs> I cannot remember what they're called, but yeah, you're right. They are they are pretty weird. Um, are we good on this slide? Yes. And then by the end of the uh, a major radiation, yeah, sort of. Um, I guess eh, that's probably not entirely accurate. They started undergoing their radiation in the Carboniferous and kind of by the end of it. So right sort of at the tail end, the, they split and they started undergoing radiations. Um, as a result of the Carboniferous rainforest collapse, which we'll talk more at the end. Um, yeah, so, and this, so, that, so this is so this is when the civil war between the synapses and the diapsis began. Yes. Yep. And so um, uh, by the by the Permian, these guys had gotten much larger in size. But it is interesting to note that at the very end of the Carboniferous, they're nearly identical, which is like exactly what you expect under. Common descent. Wow, what a surprise! So it was really like a best sneeches on the beaches situation. It was who had the most, the right amount of holes in the head, and they separated that way. It's like I don't. Yeah, know. <laughs> I, I love that Dr. Seuss book with the stuff. Talk about the stars on their on their, on their stomachs. Yep, the star-bellied sneeches. <laughs> the, the, the synapses were the star-bellied sneeches of the late Carboniferous. Yeah, I mean that's that's entirely possible. Yeah. <laughs> and the diapsons were like, Phew. and then they dominated for like uh, entire the entire Mesozoic era. So they really put us in our place. I mean, that's that's true. They did do that. <laughs> um, so I, I just put up a couple of pictures just to show how similar all the amniotes were. Um, Hylonomus was the that guy on the, the top left. That's an early anapsid. So related to like the periosaurs and mesosaurs. So at, so at uh, this time you couldn't really tell the difference unless you tore the skin off their skulls. Yeah, ex- pretty much exactly. Yeah, it's like it's just the biogeography where they live. And were we starting to notice any uh, uh, heterodontary or don't? Uh, oh, heterodonty. Uh, yeah, within. Uh, I don't know at this point. They're so they're like tiny insectivores. So, so I. Basil. Yeah, they're they're so small. I'm not sure. I, I bet I it's all those pig teeth on these guys. <laughs> it it probably. Yeah, they were just so so small and yeah, and just eating insects. So you don't really need, you know, super uh, complex teeth for for munching beetles. Do you know what the earliest uh, heterodont? Uh, nope. Organism was. I do not. Hmm. I'm wondering too. Sorry. I don't. I don't have any idea. <laughs> I hope you weren't expecting me to be like, oh, it was this because I I don't know. I I, I no I I don't know. It, you got me on that one. <laughs> Um, Petrolacosaurus is the early diapsid, that little guy on the bottom left, and 
early synapsid, so our relative Archaeothyrus on the right. So yeah, just look at look at how similar they are. They're like they're all right around the same time. And you're right, you can you you can distinguish them just by how many holes they have in their skull. That's about it. <laughs> they're just so basal. Um, Probably had the same diet, competed in the same ecological yeah. niches, and yeah, you know, depending on which one was where. It, it, there, this radiation event after the rainforest collapse was was fast too, because it didn't just it didn't just weed out uh, some of the amphibian competition. It weeded out some of the arthropod competition, and some of those niches have been mm -hmm. held since. Well, since I, want, I, I almost want to say the late Carboniferous, really. Uh, yeah. When, when arthropods really started coming onto land, and and they held onto those until about this time, to that rainforest collapse, it was just too much for a lot of uh, a lot of clades to take. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So now we move over from the terrestrial vertebrate fauna to the terrestrial invertebrate fauna. Woo! And so, <laughs> so um, among the the terrestrial, I, originally this was terrestrial fauna, and so that's why I have vertebrata included on in the list. It was just all the terrestrial fauna, or all the terrestrial phyla, I should say. It's vertebrata, platyhelminthes, nematea, annelida, mollusca, rotifera, nematoda, nematomorpha. Tardigrada, Annika, Flora, and Arthropoda. So those are all the clades, all the phyla, which have at least some terrestrial members. Arthropoda and, was definitely the, the well, I don't know, Annelida. They, they're both still going pretty strong, but uh, this is what people yeah. always talk about when they talk about the the invertebrates of the Carboniferous is the the giant arthropods, and that circles back to your to your oxygen chart that you were talking about before that it mm. really did allow for again there wasn't a lot of necessarily a lot of diversity in the, among insects but among arthropods in general there mm -hmm. was especially among myriopods which uh you have you, well, today we have millipedes and centipedes and symphala but back in those days there were so many and they were so diverse and had so many different arrangements of their their segments and their bodies very fascinating creatures. Sorry, I didn't mean to step on you there. Uh, go no, ahead. No, th this is why you're here. You're here to to uh, Fan as our, our <laughs> resident uh, bug expert. <laughs> That's why you're here. Um, yeah. So this is a chart from a paper of uh, molecular time trees reveal a Cambrian colonization of land and a new scenario for this own evolution. Um, pretty much the only arthropods that were or the only Vert, uh, the only phylum which was on land uh, by the end of the Cambrian was probably the arthropods, and there were some millipedes. Maybe there are some tracks like the uh, Diplocnides, which are on in um, probably terrestrial sediments by the end of the Cambrian. So right at the very end, the first millipedes were making their way out there, and there were some land plants, like we said earlier, they were hugging. The, the streams and lakes like bryophytes and orthoceraphytes uh, thing or sorry anthoceraphytes and um, hepatophytes but nothing big and so early millipedes are probably grazing on those um, and then you have chilocerates and insects which came along later or well stem chilocerates and, and insects yeah. which there were things that it. looked like silverfish kind of in the mm -hmm. begin in the early uh carboniferous and silverfish are super basal uh you can kind of see uh that when you look at their anatomy uh they're one of the the, the few that don't Vindalia, did you i was gonna say you're gonna hear more about that about brain bugs explanation of that go check out our race race to the race to the land episode that he talked about the insects being us to the land yeah, they they did do that. Yeah, um, we also have, so these are like all ectozoans on here. So you have velvet worms also right next to that picture of the tick. Um, velvet worms are kind of interesting as a group, the onychophorans, onychophorans, because they appear. The stem onychophorans appeared in the Cambrian, like Hallucigenia and Calincium and all those guys, and some of them went some really weird evolutionary directions like it, it's a whole story unto itself how weird some of them got um but, but 
but the actual crown um uh Annika Forens didn't appear until way after the Cambrian, so like in the the Silurian or Devonian, because one of the, the characters that the early guys don't have is slime glands. All modern Annika Forens have these slime glands, which they use to trap prey, but the early ones, like Hallucigenia, don't. So Sir, so are these like coming to this chart here? This is like like five different wait going the five different times going to land one two oh three, you're trying to four. sort out what the chart's showing it showed uh w at what era each group moved on to land so when yeah. the ones that, the green area it, which it, i don't know if i fully agree with because well yeah, yeah this that, that, yeah. it's it's so this is a um so one of the interesting arguments um and i i don't have a dog in that fight but one of the interesting arguments between um uh, or is between uh, the geneticists and the paleontologists. So the paleontologists say, um, you th I think actually, I think the earliest uh, possible millipede tracks are in the Ordovician, not actually the late Cambrian. But their argument was that the, um, the molecular data shows that there may have been millipedes by the in Cam or the or terrestrial millipedes by the in Cambrian. Yeah, and so yeah, it's it is contentious. You're right. Um, I just chose this chart because I thought it was a good, a good little um, picture. Uh, um, so, not, but yes, so, there is there is some debate. So it yeah. may, so it may not, so it may not, may or may not have been five different, like a few. Like, well, it's more about how early. Yeah, how early the uh, the myriopods came on to land i think this okay. chart is i get i'm sure this chart's just being conservative though um with the uh arachnids because i think that there were uh that there oh, yeah no there were a bunch of of different yeah, groups of arachnids which independently made it to mm -hmm. land yeah yeah he's just saying this was the the earliest uh, recorded occurrence of them yeah yeah absolutely because um freaking um like scorpions and spiders, I think got to lay in like independently, didn't they? Uh, yeah, they. Well, or was there only one for arachnids scorpions and spiders? Uh, but uh, arachnids, I think, only had one. Uh, oh, okay. Event that they came on the lands, but uh, uh, the other the other arthropods, uh, I think among the chelicerates, there were other mm. uh, groups that came on the land too, separately, independently. So you right. had like your, uh, and they actually had a little bit of a, a the like the Eurypterids had kind of a, a a spike in their diversity uh, right before the rainforest collapse. Mm -hmm. where they were doing pretty good, um, but then they didn't really the the terrestrial ones, as far as I know. Correct me if I'm, if you know of any that did. I don't think any of them survived beyond uh, the end of the Carboniferous. Uh, the I don't real ones. think so. I don't. Did they? Uh, actually, wait, did Jacolopterus, was that Permian, or was that Devonian? Well, no, it wasn't terrestrial anyway, though. No, it wasn't. It was aquatic. Yeah, it would have so. been. Well, I think it might have been fresh water, though. Yeah, I think you're right. Um, so you have the Onychophorans and the Nematodes, or the, is that little green worm? And then, on the far right, we have the Preapulids, the penis worms, and they were always aquatic. Always little, mer little guys living in the the mud of marine yeah. sediments Do, so doing the thing and weren't they the yeah. I, I i remember weren't they the ones that caused the era the the uh, destabilized the microbial mats of the uh yes the agronomic time? revolution yeah or extinct yeah between the like caused the eduractin the eduractin extinction or yeah that was the the agronomic revolution right at the very start of the the cambrian yeah because Treptichnus pedum, the um, the trace fossil which defines the bound, the lower boundary of the Cambrian, is a preapulid uh, trace or burrow, or at least that's the thinking on it. And so. they're not going anywhere. So if you don't like penis worms, you better suck it up because they're here to stay. <laughs> wow, what an unfortunate use of phrasing. Anyway, <laughs> <laughs> suck it up. <laughs> uh, all right, moving on. Ooh, all right. 
fun stuff here. We're finally getting to the arthropod. So this is a... Uh, so here's a, a arthropod phylogenetics. So fun fact, uh, when I was in um, like high school, they always talked about how there's the chelicerates, fine, you know, myriapods, fine. And then there were the crustaceans and the insects. Pancrustacea. Wrong. <laughs> crustaceans are not monophyletic. They are paraphyletic. If you look at this chart here, you'll see um, the green, the green uh, lines. That's one set of crustaceans. You have the ostracods and the, and the, the pentastomids. And then the, the blue, you have most of the other crustaceans, crabs, lobsters, copepods, um, barnacles, you, things you, like that. Any way, any way you could like uh, uh, zoom in on the creatures on the right side? Uh, this is about as... I mean, my, it's full screen for me, I think. Can I... Can I'm sorry, I, so it's the there we go. Is that better? It didn't change on our end. It didn't change on your end? Okay, well, it made it bigger on mine, so... I apologize. That's about okay. as big as uh, as I can make it on my end. Um, okay. So you have the chelicerates, um, which are spiders, scorpion, horseshoe crabs, ticks, and mites. Sorry, I left out the picnogonids in the um, in the list, but they're they're there. The the sea spiders, which are not spiders. You can see them down there in the brown. <laughs> yes, you can. Yep, that's true. They represent. Um, the myriapods, the, as you said, the symphylons, um, the parapods, um, centipedes and millipedes, and then the pan crustaceans. So the crustaceans and the insects and, or the hexapods, I should say, because you do have a couple little groups like the, uh, oh, that's interesting. They included the columbolins as members of the hexapods. How curious. Hmm. Hmm. Wait, no. I'm thinking the insects. No, columbolins are hexapods. They're outside the insects, though. That's what that's it is. In the, that's in the My yellow bad. here, right? That's in the red at the very top. Yeah, the hexapoda. And so they have columbola, diplura, and then the archignatha, thysanura, and ephemeroptera are the insects. Okay. Okay. All right. I confused myself for a second there. We're all good now. Ephemeroptera, <laughs> and then we have... Ephemeroptera, Thysanura, and Archaeognatha. Okay. I can um, I can see what I can see. Um, I can't. The the words are too blurry for me to read. So I was trying to see if I could guess what they what they were. <laughs> well, you said Ephemeroptera. Yeah. And I've been seeing a lot of those recently. They're they've been all over the place. I I don't know if it's that time of year. I guess I don't know. Yeah. So, Breeding no. season. Um, there's been a. I've been disappointed, actually. I was hoping uh, we would get more locust. I haven't even heard any yet. Uh, or not locust. What am I saying? The cicadas. That we get more cicadas. Oh, okay. Yeah. Gotcha. The 17-year-old uh, uh, brood X. I was hoping we would get more of those around this area, and we didn't. <laughs> uh, I'm sorry to hear that. Well, I know you get to enjoy them down there in Louisiana. I'm sure you just love the sound of them screaming in your trees. I don't think I've seen that many of them, honestly. Oh, really? I don't think I have. Uh, at least maybe maybe I just haven't because I'm not observant. I don't know. Um, gigantism. So, so, yes, Carboniferous gigantism. So, so we've talked about the Carboniferous oxygen levels of being super high compared to modern levels. And so this means you can produce more oxygen, but also arthropods, the reason they got so large and the reason there are none today which are that large, is arthropods do a large amount of their respiration through their skin. They have these little spiracles which are just all along it, their segments. It's like you have and, little nostrils on your butt. You have little nostrils yeah. all on your butt. <laughs> you have little nostrils on your butt. Yes, that's exactly... <laughs> well, that's, that's why like, you look at like how, I, how a diving beetle or a... Uh, even a, a diving bell spider, how they mm -hmm. breathe, they just stick their they stick their abdomen out because they're sticking their spiracles out of the water and, and breathing uh, like yeah. a butt snorkel. <laughs> like a butt snorkel, yes. Yeah. So exactly. I'm putting all kinds of terminology. You need to bring this up in your classes and make sure that people are using Why these proper terms. are we not talking about the butt snorkel? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, now, real fast, uh, 
they were bigger than they are today, but that they were like movie movie monster size big. No, it would not be possible for uh, I at 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 my girlfriend's house. We watched this hilarious like nineteen fifties um, or nineteen sixties. It was a black and white movie with a giant telepathic crab, and so. Um, yeah, this crab was, it was huge. It was like house size, but no, they could never get that big because they would collapse under the weight of their own chitin. It the just biggest, would crush them. The you biggest see, aquatic Arthur, sorry, go ahead. I was saying, do you ever see the movie Eight Legged Freaks of a Young Scarlett Johansson? Yes, I have. Uh, I don't, I don't think, I'm sure you have. I don't think I have. <laughs> David Arquette. Yeah, those spiders were like, see, all the spider things were like, and Super they were big. the spiders were screaming and making like velociraptor sounds. It's like, oh man. <laughs> no, uh, I, I haven't. Sorry. But we talked we mentioned uh Jackalopteryx uh You're earlier. Right. Yes. In the uh and that was the largest uh known like 16 arthropod. Feet. Yeah, it was a, like a like a Nile crocodile size. So it, it was a large animal. Uh, uh, yes. uh, definitely, definitely megafauna, but not anything like a movie. The biggest arthropod on land is our is our our boy Arthropleura, which is the giant millipede. Which I don't want to say too much about if Jackson's got a slide for it coming up. Ooh, maybe, maybe. Um. So, um. So, yep. Higher oxygen levels, more energy, breathing through their skin. So lots of, and it's not just arthropods who do that. Lots of um, different clades of invertebrates do that because if you're small, um, generally you don't need like lung systems. Or if you have a lot of entries for air to get in, then you don't need a lung system so much. You can do like respiration through your skin. Um, and so brachiopods uh, do that too. And so as you can see right there, there's Gigantoproductus which is a gigantic brachiopod. Look at the size of that thing. It's huge. Fun fact real quick. Uh, tarantulas, uh, mygalomorphic spiders in general, they, their spiracles, they don't really have spiracles anymore. They have uh, book lungs, which are a completely different, uh, different respiratory organ. Uh, we do think that they evolve from uh, spiracles or spiracle-like structures. But mm -hmm. they allow them to still get a little bit bigger than what you see with most invertebrates with uh, with spiracles today. That's why tarantulas tend to be uh, large bodied arthropods. Right. Right. Yeah. So, so our first group of arthropods, da 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 da, chelicerates. The chelicerates. Yes. So as we've. I mentioned a couple of times, uh, Jacolopterus was a Eurypterid, one of the, the so-called sea scorpions, even though they weren't actually scorpions. Um, they were major freshwater and lagoonal predators during uh, the Carboniferous, as well as other earlier periods like the Devonian. And so the largest one for which we have terrestrial tracks is known as Hibertopterus, which was 6.6 .6 feet in length. That's a chunky boy. It's a big so, old so boy. So Brian, question for you in here: Were the uh, the so-called sea scorpions and arthropod, whatever, were they with the biggest ones bigger than the biggest ones on land? Were they bigger than the, the well? They were always bigger in the water. Yeah. Uh, on land, I, I don't think that any of them exceeded the size of what we like the coconut crabs that we have today. I don't think we have any evidence that any of them got any bigger than that. Which is still they're they're big arthropods. They they were pretty successful until the rainforest collapse. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. Also, fun fact: coconut crab, not a crab. Ha ha. Right. ha, ha. Um, we talked about walking with monsters earlier, and so I felt like this was a good point to uh, throw in where they had a whole series of events involving a giant spider called Megarachne. It was not a spider, actually. Whoops. Yep. Megarachne was a Eurypterid, which was originally mistaken for a spider, but it was corrected. It was um, a terrestrial Eurypterid, too. Yeah, yeah, but it was yeah, like fairly small. It was much smaller than Hippertopterus, which is pictured here. Um, so, so, besides, so besides that... 
with those th with those three main characters in that thing uh, of the insect characters or arthropod characters mentioned in, the, in in that documentary, whatever it's called, accurate or were they all all three wrong? Well, I mean, one of them was. I mean, they had like Hylonomus in there, which is just a little lizard, and I think Arthropora. And then um, the, the, also probably, had that giant dragonfly thing too. Where oh, the, the, yeah. Meganura. Meganura. That stole, that stole the 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 amniote from that from the from the spire uh, what spire thing. Like that, that but, was pretty but, accurate about Meganura. It was uh, uh, what we know about modern dragonflies and how successful. Well. Let, let, yeah, what we know about the modern dragonflies and how successful they are, we yeah. we mm -hmm. can uh, we can make pretty good inference on how Meganura hunted. And I, 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 I love that. Just like like mine. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. Um, the I did mention a, there is one spider here, uh, or sorry, well, not pictured here, but I decided to show or to discuss a Carboniferous spider, an actual Carboniferous spider. Uh, in monoracne, which was only about 0.4 inches, so very small. <laughs> yeah, and they, the ancestors of uh, of spiders, uh, were did start small. Like uh, they're very closely related to mites. If you look mm -hmm. at look at how mites are structured anatomically, you can see a lot of correlation there. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and then of course the giant scorpion, um, Pulmona scorpius. Which was twenty eight inches, so over two feet. Yeah, there's actually a, a really boy. nice fossil of that. I really want to get a replica of it, but I can't find it. Bone clone doesn't have it or anything. Hmm. There, yeah, there. Uh, that's that's pretty big. That's, I had a a black forest scorpion, and uh, you know he's only a couple inches long. He's like two inches long or so. This guy was two feet long. So substantially My black longer. My scorpion died. Yeah, well, they only live like two to three years, isn't it? Yeah, it, it, he was full grown when I got him too. I still have my emperor. Yeah. So, <laughs> but uh, yeah, they they were pretty. Uh, I would love to have a uh, pulmono scorpio or scorpius kirkadensis. It'd be so awesome. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would be pretty neat. Then, of course, the one, the only Arthropora armata. Uh, King which, of the arthropods. Yep. It was, it was an eight foot millipede. So big herbivore. Now we want to clarify that it was not the predator you see in walking with monsters. <laughs> yes. I thought they, they, they said that one was a predator. It was a predator too. Uh, or maybe that was on, uh, did they say it was on a predator, a predator on the, uh, a primeval. Maybe they called it a, that one was a predator. I know that when this one reared up to fight the uh, to to fight, it had the 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 what they call it toxo tardigrins or whatever. I for, the forceps oh, uh, okay. receptuals. It had those. Um, but then it, it didn't like it, a centipede. Yeah, they had forceps like a centipede uh, in the in the walking with series, which uh, we don't think that it had now. Right, because it was yeah, because it had been been an herbivore. It was a millipede, like it literally is yeah. a millipede. It's not like related to them, and we actually still have some closely related millipedes to these that you can you can actually used to be able to get them as pets. I used to have a few, but they're called feathered millipedes because they look like a feather when they're just laying still. That's pretty cool. They're they're so tiny, and it's so funny to think that the largest arthropod ever lived has this descendants. It's only descendants are about an inch long. Well, the um, well, in fairness, there were arthropora. Um, who were only like a couple inches long in the yeah. fossil record. So, yeah. Yeah, they ran kind of the gamut of, the, of sizes. There were everything from modern, the same size as modern millipedes to these giants. Eight right. Two inches is that's, that's massive. They could almost lay on, lay down on top of it. It'd be like a moving mattress. <laughs> they, they did also find these guys in, or, uh, they rescued one in prehistoric park with Nigel Marvin. So, yeah, it was it was acting aggressive too. It raised up like uh, the defensive posture. Yeah, yeah. You ever had a centipede do that to you? No, I have not. It's uh, absolutely terrifying. Look, it's I'm, like a, a cobra with legs. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, that does sound horrifying. Um, 
course, these guys went extinct at the end of the Carboniferous as a result of the rainforest collapse. And by then they were, or by the start of the next period, they would have had to, to compete with large carnivorous um, uh, synapsids and diapsids. So it's probably for the best. They had a good run anyway. So, but like did. At, at yeah. this time, but like in like in another, another actor, the Walking Dead monster, Monsters movie, the only thing they had to worry about was those giant, giant amphibian type creatures. Well, yeah, if they got too close to the water, they could be prey for like you know baggy herpeton or something like that. Some other big was it crocodile like Aerops in the series? Yeah, Aerops is another. Yeah. Um. Because pretty much all the amphibians at this point were insectivores, or they ate smaller, you know, tetrapods. For the yeah. most were, part, Arthur they were like didn't have to worry about anything. Yeah, for the, for most, the most part. part. Yeah, if he's just hanging out in, you know, the forest away from the bot, the you know, bodies of water, then yeah, per, he's pretty much okay. But base, but but our our ancestors, the amniotes, were pretty much at the bottom of the time, the bottom of the food chain. Yeah, they would have been prey for for uh, the amphibians or pulmonoscorpius or any, any, yeah. anything that ate meat. <laughs> yep, pretty much anything. So uh, then the pancrustaceans, a whole bunch of different lineages of pancrustaceans got big. Um, and these are, and like we mentioned earlier, Meganeura and Megatypus, which are not dragonflies that's one of the things that, like the the oh look dragonflies haven't changed since the carboniferous well they, they weren't dragonflies because dragonflies yeah. are members of the order odonata whereas meganera and megatypus were called griffin flies and they're me members of megan isoptera so a different order um and part of the reason is they lack the diagnostic wing characters of dragonflies so but they're they're of... more like a basal group there are a lot of homologies that modern dragonflies do retain from uh, their divergence from this group, though. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, they're they're just this is just a more primitive group. And uh, uh, how important this group is to I mean, th these are the first animals to take flight. This is I mean, to take powered flight uh, insects just and, and there was these uh, these four winged uh monsters uh that that really uh, uh yeah. paved the way for the, the for our ecosystem to expand the way that it does yes. and for there to be flighted predator and prey relations and things like that yes. um as he was talking about the uh the walking with series i keep going back to that because i grew up with that i just love that series where yeah. you see the uh the the griffin fly uh snag the little little yeah. Uh, I think I, I think it was a diapsid. I'm not sure, but uh. yeah, yeah, but yeah, but before 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 bats, before birds, before pterosaurs, it, these guys hit the air first. Yeah, mm -hmm. and we see uh, a lot of evolutionary traits towards. Uh, you see uh, early beetles uh, developing their current mm -hmm. wing structures. This is. The period yep. where we, uh, some of it we have fossils of from this period. Others we have to, to infer from from the remains of later divergent groups in in, in different periods. Uh, we can date back and see kind of that they diverged during this period. But there was a lot going on with insect wings at this time. Like mm -hmm. it, pretty much every direction you can think of. Uh, with and we see that today, I guess with uh, like like dipterans, you see a lot of variety in their wings too. But uh, yeah. Yeah, but, but they got the lucky. We we had to ha we, we had to have to modify our arms for wings. They they <laughs> didn't. <laughs> yeah, they had a whole extra set of appendages. Yeah, and there's um and uh, the developmental data has kind of shaken out that um the tissue which forms the wings comes fr comes from both the back and the legs. So they sort of refashioned two different types of tissue for for flight ultimately. So Okay, that's interesting. Um, yeah, and is that for, that's for all four wings, or yeah, they... yeah, that's that's for yeah for all the wings because um because the flies have they have their second set of wings. It's just the the haltiers. Well, so you know, like arthropods, as you as you look down through the age, they start with a, a 
like 12 legs uh, was was generally the standard and kind of worked their way down uh, with more yeah. specialized appendages. Mm-hmm. Uh, and I wonder if there was some horizontal gene transfer going on there to move the... Uh, have you ever looked at a, a close-up of a fly? How okay. they have the, uh, the little appendages that change directions? I'm wondering if uh, if something along those lines wasn't wasn't transferred like through a virus or something to I, I'm just speculating to like mayflies to reduce that wing. Uh, Does that make know. any sense at all? Am I just rambling? I uh, I have not the foggiest idea. Yeah, I'm just I'm just speculating. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um. We, uh, well, speaking of mayflies, uh, we have a, a, a group of primitive mayflies with the Centana pteroidea, uh, which contains some members with very large wingspans, uh, like 17.7 inches. That's over a foot. So that's it's like a foot and a half. That's or almost almost foot and a half. Yeah. So that's um pretty good size for <laughs> for an insect wingspan. Right. Yeah. That's like a sparrow. Yeah, and those seventeen inches—that's bigger than a sparrow. That's holy crap. That's uh, it's almost like a hawk. Yeah, yeah, that's that's pretty good size. Um, or well, yeah, for for Megan uh, early area, it was two point three foot wingspan. So that's I, I can't even imagine seeing a bug that big. That's enormous, ludicrously right. large, massive. Uh, would, would you so Brian? Would you like? Like the all uh, cool, or would you free? Would you like all? Uh, oh no! Oh no! <laughs> With a uh, a mega neura? Yeah. Oh my god! I would be in awe. I'd be worried about my little dog. If I knew my little dog was safe, then I'd be. <laughs> <laughs> but could uh, could probably make a pretty good living off all the squirrels that I got run, running around out here. I got a walnut tree outside the house that it could. Uh, that'd be amazing to watch. Sometimes the crows <laughs> will go after them, so it'd probably be a little bit like that. Yeah. I always wondered about. Uh, about Meganura and other griffin flies that got so big during that time, if their primary prey was terrestrial or, uh, or if it was, if they were feeding more like modern dragonflies on, on flying invertebrates, but with giant mayflies like that around or giant mayfly relatives, I should say like that around, I can imagine they'd have a pretty good uh, food source. Yeah, absolutely. I wasn't actually yeah. familiar with this one, so you taught me something cool today. Um, so I'm going to have to look into those guys a bit. Do we, what Boho do we have? Wing, wing, wing uh, fossils and stuff from them, do we? Yeah, and I'll actually, I have a picture on the next slide because it was, okay. I had kind of too many words on this one. I didn't want to cram it all in there. So they're on the next cool. slide. Um, and then Paleodictyoptera, which is a very interesting order, in my opinion, because they have three pairs of wings. Yeah, that's kind of what I was getting out earlier when I was talking about experiment. They, they, there was some crazy experimentation going on with. Uh, it was the college years for insects. Yeah, yeah there was like the, the so the shield on a beetle, like the the, the, the elytra Titan shield. Yeah, it the elytra. Yeah. Uh-huh. It's uh, that's modified. Mod that's their modified wings. I mean, yep. mm-hmm. it's it's amazing that uh, the the utility that the they, that has evolved for these different uh, different structures. Uh, yeah, yeah. So it's, it's those those steering mechanisms on a on flies. I just find those fascinating because they're barely visible, but they make so mm-hmm. much of a difference that if you remove them, the fly will uh, hit walls and fly yeah. into. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Um. So that's so those so we had a bunch of different groups of of pen crustaceans getting large. And so here are the pictures. So we have Meganura there, which is, I mean, look at the size of that freaking thing. Good gravy. Uh, then you have the, um, uh, Boho Flebia, which is the, the Centano Teroidea. Uh, it's this guy kind of on the top, right? You can see the, the body and the wing yeah. banation and then Paleodictyoptera with their third little pair of wings right by their, their head. And I wonder if those kind of serve that same sort of purpose, like a, like a stable, like thing. a halt here. Yeah. yeah. 
I mean, that's possible. Yeah, I, I don't know, but it's really cool. Um, you know, you wonder um, if there were any like four winged, you know, groups of of these guys out there because what's regulating these is like hawks genes, and it's just a matter of duplicating your hawks genes because uh, you know you another segment, boop, just duplicate your your hawks gene again. Now you have another segment. When a hox gene duplicates, doesn't it have to mirror though? Like, like when a amphibian regrows a limb, for instance, it doesn't regrow the this limb from the back leg and, and mimic that. It, it does it from the one across from it. Right. So, when hox genes duplicate in a in a population like this, uh, is it is it being mirrored? Where which? Do we? Yeah. It, or does it come from the wi- other wings, or does it come from the limbs? Well, it's like it's it's patterning the whole section. Well, the hawkstein is like patterning the whole section, so yeah, it's it's like mirroring both sides. Okay. And so it would just tell it to. It wouldn't just say like build one wing. It would say build another pair of wings. Build another segment that bears two wings. Is what would happen. Okay. And so yeah. And it, and it would be built upon the genes of the wings behind it okay yeah it's it's like it's literally just the 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 genes telling the body hey you know build another segment that has wings and so yeah. boop there you go and the body's just okay with it it's like yeah and six sets of wings sure and it just does it it doesn't give any pushback at all and say hey this is weird well it it's possible um see one thing i would be very interested to find out is because we have Paleodictyoptera, but were there any others? Because, like, if you think about the Cambrian, you had a bunch of different, like, body plans mm-hmm. kind of coming out, and then a bunch of them got sort of wiped off the map because they weren't super successful. Um, you know, like, the Radiodonts survived kind of into the early Ordovician and then went extinct, for instance, which includes Anomalocaris. Um, so it makes you wonder... Were there lots of experiments in numbers of wings? As you mentioned earlier, there were experiments in like wing venation, all that sort of stuff. But mm-hmm. did they also experiment with wing number? So should we expect to find like um, eight winged insects or 10 winged insects? Or, or was there some kind of constraint such that they really couldn't get past okay. six wings? This was just an, a phylogenetic constraint early on that prevented them from doing that. Kind and- of... We may never know. Kind of like how we when we came out when we came out of the our answers came out of the water. Th- we had different uh, seven fingers, seven, yeah. six, eight fingers, mm-hmm. but then the right. the five fingers ones. Yep, exactly. Is there is there some kind of constraint which does not allow beyond that? Yeah. So these are interesting questions, and you know we may never have the answers to them. So. That's uh, like you know, you know. Going to find like a just a huge logger uh, shot and full of all kinds of right, so, uh, insects. Hey, you hear that scientist write a paper about that. Exactly. And, and, and credit us in it. Yep. Credit us, please. Um, and so finally we, we reached the end of the road with the carboniferous rainforest collapse. So at the end of the carboniferous, the <sighs> tropical climate, which had persisted for so long dries dries up significantly and so a lot of the the uh, ecosystems which were dependent or which were in and dependent upon the rainforest just fell through they just utterly collapsed and this resulted in a mass extinction of amphibians so a lot of the large groups of amphibians which were highly successful in the carboniferous went away as well as many of the large arthropods because they relied on those rainforest ecosystems and so now they were just, they were just gone, uh, never to resurface again. Um, but in the ashes, the amniotes had a radiation, and uh, our own ancestors took off. From yeah, there. since they, so. since they weren't, they, since all they need the water for was to drink and not to live and survive. Yep. Yeah. So yep. So our, you know, it sucks for the amphibians, but yay for us. So. <laughs> Yeah, we let a, we let the amphibian stick around in a in a marginalized niche. Be like, <laughs> yeah. 
But like you had you had your day and now it's hard amphibians turn. though are survivors look at some of those uh some of these yeah. desert toads and stuff that, that can stay submerged mm -hmm. under the blazing sands for decades yeah that's true but uh so what the carboniferous rainforest can collapse was it largely attributed to tectonics um from what I've seen, it it appears to be uh, just climatological shifts. So, Not so much. organic triggers from the. Um, it could have been. Uh, I'm not entirely um, sure. It may have been like volcanic uh, activity, which ultimately would have been yeah tectonic. Um, it could have been changes in uh, well, lots the, of things. That oxygen level couldn't just keep climbing like that without the atmosphere eventually catching fire yeah and, and right yeah and w wouldn't uh I was, I was wondering about this high level it's it's weird wouldn't high levels of oxygen mean lower levels of, of carbon dioxide and and would that mean yeah. being colder and I was, wondering, I was wondering how were there like swampy type areas if it was the carbon well, dioxide you can, have, you can have rainforest in in an ice house period i mean that's what we have okay. presently all right. Uh, it, it's like you can have cooler periods um, where you have polar ice caps, but you still also have equatorial rainforest regions. There That's were we at right least now. periodical ice caps during the Carboniferous. Mo the, yeah. the big thing about the Carboniferous you got to keep in mind is that for the majority of the time, the continent was it was one continent uh, mm -hmm. that was hugging the equator. So. Even even if it was like the temperature is today, most of the world would be the Amazon basin. All right, so Pangea right. was already existed by this time. It wasn't it was still yes, Pangea it was actually starting started to break up in a the, little bit in the Cambrian. Yeah, you were God. Uh, there was a so there was a isthmus between uh, what would later be Africa and uh, like. Uh, so South America, South American Africa, and then oh, I got a map. Yeah, I'll I'll show my map after you're done. With oh, okay. Slides. Here, uh, let me stop sharing so you can show it. Yeah, let's see. Right. Where's the share screen? At the bottom. I got. It. There we go. Right, and click. click. All da, right. Da, da, so. da. So this is the late Carboniferous. This is right before Pangea broke up. Um, and you can see, uh, you see that? Okay, there we go. So you got yeah. what was Africa uh, in the Arabian Peninsula over here. And this is all what would become uh, like Central Asia and Europe. Mm -hmm. So everything's all jammed down in here. Now it's split right here. Uh, and South America would separate uh, later in the Mesozoic and and not reconnect with with the northern with the northern part of Pangaea until uh, fairly recently. So that's an interesting fact about this. But yeah, yeah I did not know that. I I, I always thought that it didn't start breaking up until the, about the Triassic era. era. Uh, right, right about here is uh, the Permian. It was uh, so. What do we got? The Permian. Uh, it was about like this for most of the Permian. I believe we had a shift of South America to the West here, moving up. And uh, I think these are coming down a little bit. I'm not sure about the, the tectonics. It's been a while since I've, uh, since I've looked at those maps. I used to love doing that, going through and watching the, the plate tectonics uh, mm -hmm. shift. Yeah. But the key feature we want to take away from this is that, you know, we have the, most of the, the continents, Again, this is pushed down because this is late Carboniferous, was straddling the equator for the majority of the time. So it was all hot, swampy atmosphere <laughs> mm -hmm. um, for these uh, for these life forms to thrive in. Yeah, absolutely. Nice. Click noise. All right. So thus closes the Carboniferous and thus begins the Permian. Bum, bum, bum. Yeah. Were, were the were the biggest death of all was weighing them. Arthropods <laughs> yeah. peaked in high school. 
<laughs> yeah, they did, didn't they? Right now it's the uh, we're getting ready to move into the reign of the archosaurs. Uh, synapses kind of give them a run for the money here at the uh, at, mm -hmm. in the Permian, but then uh, uh, yeah, archosaurs just leave us in the dust. But yeah, 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 it, yeah like like this for a while in the Permian, the, the synapses, our ancestors were like. The, like the, the big guys, like the the Medrons and the Gorgonopsis, but then the the Diapsis took over for a few million years. But then the there were some. Were there there were some large bodied? Uh, maybe I'm maybe I'm wrong. Were there some large bodied uh, uh, Diapsid di herbivores during the Permian? I think there were a few um, here and there, um, but. Yeah, they they it, wouldn't they wouldn't become a major uh mem major like ecosystem players until the 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 Triassic. But yeah, there were a few. There were some some smaller um, uh, Permian diapsids. Did had uh crocodile crocodile morphs had not diverged from not yet. Yeah, the the okay. archosaur the big split in archosaurs kind of occurred right at the start of the Triassic. Okay. And so you had the Pseudosuchians going one way and then the uh, dinosaur morphs going the other way. And so they, or Ava Metatarsalia, sorry. And so that led to the dinosaur morphs. It's and, so uh, weird that, that Suchia is nested in Pseudosuchia now. Yeah, the, I, the, the real crocodiles nest among the fake crocodiles, yeah. Yes. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So what was it, maybe it was you that, that retweeted what Dar when Darren Nash was was complaining about uh, was it para aves being uh, nested within aves or is that oh a that yeah was. aves nests within uh, the para aves yeah Same. so the the next birds met or the the real birds are within the next birds yeah <laughs> so yeah you know I didn't invent the taxonomy it's a uh, it, Curse you, Carl. It's not Linnaeus. <laughs> yeah. It's it's kind of funny because like, okay, so I want to I'll, I'll give your, your mind, turn your mind into a pretzel. If, so the, uh, you guys have heard about the new phylogeny of dinosaurs where theropods and the ornithiscans nest together to the exclusion of the sauropods. Oh, yeah. yeah, yeah. I that, right, where that the old one list. was the theropods and the sauropods nest together to the exclusion of the ornithiscans, right? Yeah. Right. All right. So with that in mind, keep that in mind. The old, the definition of dinosauria is passer, right? The, the birds, the, the passerines, to triceratops. Triceratops is an ornithischian. Passer is a theropod. So if Passer and Triceratops nest together oh. to the exclusion of sauropods. Sauropods are no longer dinosaurs. Wow. Would they oh. still be would they still be what they call dinosaur morphia or dinosaur forms? They, not, they still dinosaurs? Mean, well, that's just the I mean, everyone's gonna still call them dinosaurs. They'll still do, they'll just move. They'll they'll just move it. They'll just say, like, no, we're not gonna say sauropods are not dinosaurs. But I mean, technically. Properly, they should create yeah, a way that sauropod should be elevated to what, like, uh, would it be yeah. order? Uh, yeah, something like that, you know, because they'll they'll be um, they're not dinosaurs anymore, per the old but definition yeah, I, of dinosaur. I, I, I forget, I forget so, how yeah. it, it worked. I think it's the same way with mammals, too. There was like mammal morpha and mammal forms before there was actual mammals. There are, yes, yeah, yeah. There, there's. The mammalia formies, which includes like the tritilodonts and the trithelodonts, which are not quite, which are before you have like the monotremes branching off, because the tritilodonts and the trithelodonts still have the double jaw joint. They don't have the the yeah. normal mammal jaw joint that uh, monotremes and and placentals yeah. have. But it was the same way with dinosaurs, wasn't it? Dinosaur morpheus, I think, if I remember correctly. Yes. It. Yeah, uh, yeah. You have Ava Metatarsalia, which is like pterosaurs and the dinosaur morphs. But within dinosaur morpha, you have like the psilosaurids, mm -hmm. and then you have the actual dinosaurs. Yeah. But, but so, if, so if it did branch off, the sauropods would be would be like they'd be, more, they'd be dinosaur morpha. And they would be so yes, dinosaur morphs, but not dinosaurs. 
for the the original and that i think well the thing is though um it's the the um the baron at all hypothesis of of ornithischians plus sauropods is or plus sorry plus theropods is not totally accepted um it yeah. seems kind of um it seems equivocal right now which one okay. is which one what better this, what did that mean for Herrerasaurus? So interestingly, the Herrerasaurids were placed by Baronet all as basal sauropodomorphs. So now Her Herrerasaurus would be the basal two sauropodomorphs, but not to not to theropods. Yeah. That's so weird because they they always depict them as very basal theropod. Yes. Very... Yeah, exactly. Yeah, like e you have Eo Raptor. Which is like right there, and then you have uh -huh. like the Herrerasaurids, and then you get into the Coelophysoids. But yeah, no, the they moved the Herrerasaurids yeah. to the basal sauropodomorphs. And it turns out there are other basal sauropodomorphs. Um, I'm drawing a blank on the name, but there's another one which is a carnivore, um, which is also a basal sauropodomorph. So they were all like all the the little basal lineages were like either insectivores or yeah. carnivores before they became herbivores before this i thought it was, it was uh, if this was true or not true i don't know it was, i always thought it was weird i was i thought it was a weird science thing that the dinosaurs that became birds were not part of the bird hip group they were probably, right mm -hmm. yeah <laughs> yep or near the skids uh and then uh the sauruskians yeah sauruskians yeah like, which are the lizard the the birds are evolved from the lizard hip dinosaurs which is funny because, well, if you look, once you get closer, like within the Manoraptora, so like the rap, the birds, the raptors, and like Therizinosaurs, once you get like into that group, so they're very close to the birds, the hip starts, or the, the ischium starts uh, going backwards rather than, so it was like in this, so you had like this formation, yeah. or sorry, I think it's that formation, and they both start kind of going backwards like that. Whereas, yeah, for the ornithischians, it's like that, like the, the bird hip, but then it's more like that yeah. for the sauruskians, and so it starts moving back. And so, Wait, which one's more basal? Uh, well, they're sister to each other. Well, it, it depends on which one. Well, I guess neither of them are really basal to each other per se, because they're all kind of coming from the same starting point. Okay. But, yeah, I always thought it was just a weird science thing, like like how. Two uh, flammable elements makes water, and two poisonous elements make salt. <laughs> right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. That's I why mean, the creationists won't listen to us because we have weird things like that going on. <laughs> Science doesn't make any dang sense. What's happening? Yeah. Uh, we, we, uh, we mentioned this in the in our, in our Twitter PMs, but how come? Uh, I think it's just American, maybe just American that we that we decide that Carboniferous is stupid. We're gonna, we're going to call it after two of our states and st to make two oh, of our states. It's yeah, because it's, the, the yeah. it's because of the formations um, is, is why it's divided up because there's the Mississippian formation and the Pennsylvania formation, um, and they were they, they, now they were both discovered after uh, so the Cambrian. Uh, formation in Cambria is what it's named for, and that's in in uh, northern uh, it's it's or just south of Wales, I believe, in the UK. I think so. Yeah, um, you're right. And so that's where the the period was named after. But we had our own paleontologist over in the states, and at that time there was not a lot of understanding about plate tectonics. So every arrow was named after the formation, the major formations that they were found in. So you had the Pennsylvanian mm -hmm. formation. Uh, which is, I, I think, it all lies to the east of the Appalachian Mountains, okay. and then you have the Mississippian Formation, which is where I live. It's all underneath, from I believe, from like down like by Arkansas all the way up to the Great Lakes is is Mississippian Formation. But I, what I don't understand is what's what's the thing called that's not that's smaller than a period, an epoch, epoch. Okay, I, I forget how. Yeah, because you have like so after the Cretaceous period, you have the Paleocene, um, Eocene, Oligocene, Miocene, Pliocene, and Plasticene uh, epochs. This is all part of a certain 
it, right it now. gets even more complicated, dude. So the uh, the Pennsylvanian and the Mississippian are both divided into three sections. Yeah, uh, early, middle, and late, and then you have uh, regional names uh, <laughs> for different formations in Europe too. What is it, the the Scoven? Uh, I can't think of any uh, any more of them off my head. That's the one that I'm most familiar with is the Muscovian but, uh, right. for, formation. And like the Visian yeah. and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, yeah. But, yeah. yeah I was wondering why we call them, we, we besides calling them periods instead of calling them two epochs within the Carboniferous period. Well, well, the funny thing is, we then there, there are also like stages um, because the... The um the time period for which like a particular epoch or stage within a period lasted, there may be some debate um, depending on what you're talking about. Now, if you're looking at like the Cretaceous, for instance, um, then by and large it's all relatively settled. You have like the Turonian, Cenomanian, Mostritan, etc. But if you get on if you get down to like the Cambrian and you look at the very beginning, then you have some debate. Is it the the uh, Manichaean is it the uh, Namakit Daldinian or is it the um, what is it stage one uh, or Tomotion? Those are all the same. Those are all different names for like the same span of time. That's true, but it, it's it's weird that when, when we get towards the age of the mammals, we're more in the epochs before us than dinosaurs. Before that, we were periods. Before Cambrian, we're more well, like eons. That's well. The, the the reason for that is it's is less time is occurring. Like the Cretaceous occurs over like eighty million years, I think about eighty million years or so. We meanwhile the entirety of the Cenozoic occurs in about sixty five million years. So you know, yeah, relatively so short time period. So it's easier just to chop it up into a bunch of smaller segments. Like I said, before the Cam before Cambrian, it's all all eons. <laughs> the, the problem really starts with the way with the way that we started naming them after the formations and after the geological formations, and you you so you get some that were span like the the Cambrian uh, is a huge period of time, <laughs> and there wasn't a lot of uh, a lot of time markers uh, to go off of because there wasn't a lot of, at least early on, there wasn't right. a lot of life yes. we knew about that old. But yeah, it went anywhere from like, it, it it covered anywhere from like 100 million years to like 500 million years because there was no, there was no bottom. There was no way to decide, you know, where does the Cambrian um, so, start? So there was no flood layer then. <laughs> Did you guys know that the, the quaternary uh, period is actually uh, a holdover name from when the, the time, the, the ages of life were divided into, uh, into four different, different stages? We don't do that anymore, but that's how that's where that comes from. Yeah, same with the the tertiary, which is now the Cenozoic. Yeah, or oh, yeah. the Neogene and Paleogene in the new. Um, oh yeah, the, before, or, it called, the before, <laughs> yeah, before it was called the KT extinction. Now it's called the KPG extinction. Or right, because it's the it's the Cretaceous, Paleogene, and and the K comes from the the German word for um, for uh, Cretaceous, which is comes from. Um, um, what is it? Calcite. I uh, yeah, I'm not sure. I know that uh, that the period is uh, is got the the K symbol uh, because the Carboniferous took the C symbol. I know that. So yeah, and so they they use the the German word for. But then, then they, I think it's is it calcite? I think it's calcite. Okay, before uh, uh, before you guys, I, I would say then what's the Cambrian symbol then of this? Carbon if it's the C, then what's Cambrian? Oh, uh, a C with a line through it. Okay, yeah. but before can you see that? Can you see the string? Because we got we got a question. Was Are the carbon if not the main source of modern? Or, uh, uh, yeah, the the coal bearing layers come from the carboniferous. That's what the name means. And we talked about that earlier. Um, carboniferous means coal or coal bearing. The Ferris, so yeah, but it's not dinosaur fossils, though. <laughs> no, it's, all, it's, it's mostly yeah, like ninety percent plants. Maybe. Yeah, so when people say, you know, uh, we're, you know, we're in a tin can flying on dinosaurs, no, um, it's it's you know, plants uh, yeah, and diatoms like and things like that. So <laughs> yeah, yeah lycopods and diatoms. Not yeah, dinosaurs. I mentioned this in the photosynthesis episode, but can you? 
but he, he said, but you can't really get a fossils from coal, can you? Or can you? Not really, no. Yeah. I don't think so. I don't think so. Do you I'm do you know? I'm familiar with. No, I don't. I, I've never heard yeah. of them. I, I, I was wondering since, they, yeah, I since they're the remains of the fossilized <laughs> trees, you know. The only way them. I could think that that would happen would be like if there was an am, uh, uh, amber deposit that then got buried in coal. But I don't think that the, the, yeah, the environment right. to make coal would, would allow for the amber to form. Because I think it's like it's metamorphic, isn't it? For it, because like is for, that for for coal? Do you need like metamorphism for coal? Yeah, and yeah, it's got there's, there's got to be. A, I wish Orge was in the chat. There's got to be lots of lots of pressure, and uh, it has to mm -hmm. be buried down so far. And uh, I right. don't know that. Yeah, it, it's not a process that lends itself well to fossilization. There's very very specific situations that that are going to fossilize uh, yeah. organisms, uh, plants. A little bit more easier to, to leave remains of but for organisms uh especially when it comes to soft bodies you're really limited to uh like lagerstatten or amber deposits and since i heard this true or not since diamonds are from coal does that mean diamonds are are, are just plant plants too now um are they i mean you can if theoretically like you could Turn, I think, coal into diamonds under enough heat and pressure, but I don't know if that's where I, they I, come from per se. Okay. I don't think I, so. I, I don't know. I don't know that. I, I, I heard. I, I heard coal. You can coal turn into diamonds. So I don't know if the dime, all the diamonds we have well, now, are, are from yeah. The but coal you or... have to, you have to put it under substantial heat and pressure because the it's the the arrangement of the carbon atoms within the coal is different from their arrangement within diamonds, and that requires. A lot of force <laughs> to make. That. I thought that the diamonds that we have now were preceded any uh, organic organisms. They uh, probably the, they the probably carbon did. that okay. formed them preceded that. Okay, I, 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 I could did, be yeah. I could be completely okay. wrong on that. Right. That's why I was. Yeah, I, did, I didn't know if the diamonds we have were, were also ancient plant. Ancient no, I think plant. you're right on that because we have zircons, which are like a couple billion years old. So I I, I think you're right about the yeah. But the that's diamonds. not to say that there's not diamonds cooking in the in the earth right sure. now that aren't made yeah. from the carbon of uh of carboniferous life though. Sure. Yeah. Absolutely. Because you can, I believe that uh, that there's a company that'll that'll compress the remains of your loved ones into uh, a diamond for you for a uh, high high price. Yeah, yeah. Do that's I, the... You like well, what's that? Oh, that's my that's that's my aunt Gertrude of, of up there. Like what? Yeah. <laughs> I think I'll I'll be happy with just you know being plant fertilizer. I think I'll be okay with that. Yeah, so. I want like an organic coffin so or casket oh. so that. No, like, like, no, no, like, no, like, be like, your, your great grandson will give your you diamond to his wife. Like, like, like what's that? <laughs> oh, that's my, that's my grandfather Jackson. Well, I, yeah, I will... that's that's a little creepy in my opinion. I'm sorry, <laughs> that's a little weird. We will leave some carbon behind, though. So eventually, we might be diamonds, just naturally. <laughs> well, eventually, we'll end up. Our carbon will be sequestered in a limestone formation. Uh, because ultimately all the carbon ends up in, in limestone formations. So I'm just happy I'll be there with you guys. It's true. We'll all be there together in the end. We'll be we'll be little diatom shells and then you know, they'll precipitate and then we'll be stuck in limestone. Yeah. Until the people, until the heat death of the universe. <laughs> until yeah, the people will use us to uh to keep insects out of their house, dump us around. Right. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, until the heat death of the universe. Yeah. Until the until the creations of the of the future are like humans were not us they were whatever <laughs> yeah whatever we our branch evolves into that would be funny I think that they could be like well yeah humans speciated but originally humans were you know create specially created it's like okay <laughs> I ran a <laughs> poll right. the other day asking if any people uh, saying if, who would like to be fossilized I don't know if you guys answered or not but you can answer now. Would you like to be fossilized and studied by future scientists? Sure. I, my opinion is I won't be there, so it doesn't really matter to me. Like that's why yeah. I'm like, you know, I don't need to go in, in a casket in the ground. I'm just gonna be taking up space and ultimately worm food. So just 
get, you know, back into the, into the cycle. Yeah. Right. Yeah. You know, just use me as fertilizer for a tree. If I happen to be covered sometime in the future by sediment, you know, and not decompose immediately, you know, sure. I would be proud to be a a specimen to, to prove like evolutionary, uh, descent though like if there was a future species that's like oh no we weren't descent from humans and i was the right the uh transitional right. species there you go <laughs> but i mean but, that but, could happen yeah but you can't you, but you can't prove that your bones had kids or different kids oh these are facts you can't but you can't prove a fossil had children <laughs> yeah all you can show is that something died there except for like those those couple ichthyosaurs where they're like they died in childbirth or whatever so you know, I, when, when he says things like that, I'm like, if I ever get charged with murder, I hope that fucking Kent Hoven is on my jury because if he wasn't there to witness the murder, <laughs> he can't happen. prove anything. Well, no, because he's a sovereign citizen of of whatever his his ranch or whatever. So. Can, can, Dinosaur Adventureland, the nation. Yeah. Of <laughs> Kent, the the land of Kento- Kentopia. Have you guys been but, following uh, AJ's? Uh, tracking of of the hoven drama lately oh yeah I no know i don't i don't care what that man does with his yeah. life so I, well, I, I, I appreciate the work aj is putting into kind of doing the expose stuff on him though because sure, you know, people yeah. are still going to the to this guy thinking he's uh, a man of god and is going to lead them down the right path and he's got some uh some questionable stuff going on down there to say the very least <laughs> down there in lennox alabama yeah, good Just because he got kicked out of Florida. Right. At any rate. Um, do we have any uh, questions from the audience that we want to field on, that were on the on the topic? Or any um, final points that we want to hit regarding Carboniferous arthropods or other Carboniferous organisms? All right. House of Reason, Bent, if you're still there, got any questions? That's all right. I, I, when I, I turned off my... Um, my screen share, I saw that Bent Hoven was there. So if he's still there, hey, Bent Hoven. Yeah, he was in there a bit earlier. Uh, no relation. <laughs> no relation. That always makes me chuckle. Bent Hoven, no relation. You got to say the whole name. You can't just say Bent Hoven. Uh, while we're waiting for questions, you, you said that you're working on your paper. Is that your master's paper? For the dung, uh, the dung beetle thing? Yeah, we're in the very opening stages of it, so ah, uh, yeah. get, getting your getting your master's the master's thesis out there. Yep. So then I'll get my master's, and then the hope is ultimately to get, also get a PhD. So uh, now, now, question: Is it starting with "Hello, my name is Jackson Wheat"? It it definitely should. If it if it, you know, they have to let me do it. Um, people will post. I've seen people post things on Twitter like, um. I was cussing out my professor in the paper, and then I forgot to edit that out before I sent it in to her. <laughs> and so Don't she read. That. Yeah, I've seen stuff like that, and I was like, "Oof." Um, I, I can see it now. Like, uh, and the and the beetles were this, and uh, I wonder what I'm eating for lunch. I, I think I'm. I think I. I think I want a ham sandwich. Anyways, the beetles. <laughs> yeah, Bent is still here, by the way. Uh, Oh, hey, Bent Hoven, no relation. Um, I know so little about the period. I don't have intelligent questions. So that's okay, House of Reason. Um, that's what comment, that's the comment section are for if you come up with some, some later. Nobody, well, had, we really didn't talk too much about Tesma Spondyls, though. They were oh. such a huge and diverse family. Um, I know we had a couple of slides that touched on them, but I I would think that, that, that they deserve their own stream sometime to talk about. Yeah. Especially the late survivors. Kulasukas is so weird. It is a, yeah, giant Australian crocodile, but an amphibian. Right. Uh, oh, oh yeah. yeah. There, there's a, there's a, I, I, did you see the episode about giant amphibians? On, well, I think it was either Shice or Eons. I forget what it was. That there's so many different science shows on YouTube now. But there's one called Brain Bug, too. I didn't know if you've seen it, but. Uh, they did a video about uh, lobsters and Jordan Peterson the other day. It was pretty good. You should check it out. Mm. On on uh, what did you say the name of the channel was? Brain Bug. <laughs> yeah, Brain Bug. Okay, all right, all right. I'll try to remember oh, that one. Uh, oh, 
Uh, if don't 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 look around. I actually typed in bug brain one time with a totally different website, totally different YouTube channel. Yeah, um, I imagine it I exists. Got a response to my video on carbonating. It was Philip Nichols. I don't know who that is. I assume a creationist. Yeah, I'm not familiar with that person. Um, was it a good response video? I I honestly don't know if there are any response videos to anything I've put out. Um, cause I don't look for them. I really don't care if people put out response videos to me. It does not. <laughs> I should start doing response videos to Jackson. Are you going to, you know what? Uh, go ahead. I mean, look, I'm sure you can find stuff in like every video where you can be like, you know, Oh, Jackson misspoke. He should have said this or should have said that. And I'll be like, all right, fair. You got oh, me. I, I have a folder that I'm putting together a video just to make sure all the mistakes I made and errors I make when I'm speaking to put a clip show together of, of this was wrong and this was wrong and this is why this was wrong. Uh, oh, I just yeah. put it in the description. I just say, oh, I messed up. I said this, should have said this. I, I, I milk it for content like a big loser. <laughs> oh, I that's I watched your debate with Phil. Oh, OK. OK, I got you. OK, fair enough. Um, oh, he had a debate. How do you do? Yeah, that must. I think that was a while back. I I haven't been in a debate in a while either. House, I I have I have also not done a debate in a while. Not that I'm complaining. Um, the last, I think the last debate I was in was with Fazal Rana, which was a very I saw that one. Good. It was a very good chat. I really enjoy talking to Fuzz. He's a great guy. Um, very cordial, yeah. Yep. Yeah. So I enjoyed uh, that one. I wouldn't but, mind talking to him sometime. The last thing I, I remember watching it, the last thing I remember watching everything about yours was the Nephilim free debate, I think. Oh, you are not I going can't, behind that computer screen. I can't even hear his name without <laughs> getting slightly sick to my stomach. <laughs> oh, he's just. Someone's trying to make an escape back here. What is it? Is it another mantis? Uh, it, the, the, the mantis I had on the microphone. I, it, it tried to go behind the screen. Oh. <laughs> it was oh. like, I'm going to go back here where it's dark. Be like, oh. It's camera, Fair sh camera shy. But all right. We go. Let's see. Let's... Oh, so, so, Brian. So, uh, like, were any of, are any of the insects behind, bug, insect behind you, Descendants are related to the insects that we talked about. Yeah, I have, right. I have several arachnids uh, that would be, uh, that would have have had scorpion ancestors during this time period. Uh, that would have been well at the beginning of this time period. Towards the end of it, there were probably true spiders, just very small ones. Uh, it wasn't until the uh, eurypterids, the terrestrial eurypterids, started to kind of die off that they sort spiders sort of moved into that same sort of niche the spiders and modern scorpions uh of the uh the terrestrial arthropod uh, a lot of early ones were early uh, arachnids were probably detrivores or uh omnivores like uh very similar to the way that the harvestmen uh today feed there is um i'm not brainbug you may be familiar with it the the um herbivorous spiders uh yeah like uh was it bagheera kiplingi um, which I think is it like eats fruit, which I think is awesome. That's just gravy to me that there's a, a fruit eating spider. Yeah, fruit frugivorous. And they, they started off uh they're well they, they speculatively they started off eating the uh natural herbivores of that fruit, but they were get they, they, they absorb so much in their diet they they develop to digest the fruit that the uh because they, it's the same with bees, all, isn't yeah. it? Isn't that, yeah. I think the same like hypothesis for the, for the origin of, of bee pollination. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Bees are, in, bees are wasp. Bees are just her, herbivorous wasp. The ants right. are just terrestrial wasp. So right. <laughs> uh, they're not really their own clade in that way. Or they're nested within that clade because there yeah. are wasps um, that are related to either one of those clades that are close related to than they are to other wasps. Right. Yeah. Bees are, are uh, what is it, Anthophila and then um, the, and then ants are, are formicidae. Yeah. Just it's kind of like, like protists. You have like you have the, the plant like protists, the fungi like protists, and the animal like protists. So 
but they're all just like, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, just, it's like we're, we're tailless monkeys. Yeah. It's like, um, was it coenoflagellates are, are protists more closely related to us than they are to other protists. Uh, same right. with the, uh, like the oomycetes, which are more closely related to fungi than they are to other protists or volvox, <laughs> which is more closely related to plants. And, you know, so Protists are weird. They're all over the place. Yeah, that's that's why I thought really. Like, yeah, I I remember growing up that Protus was his own. They they, they said Protus his own kingdom, but not, not not anymore. It was the it was it was the I remember it was the uh, Mo, Monolaria kingdom, the Protus kingdom, and animals, fungi, and plants. Yes. Yeah. It. <sighs> it's more of a gradient, really. Protists are a freaking nightmare. <laughs> yeah. In terms of taxonomy. <laughs> Just, just, just like, just like before, the vertebrates were divided into fish, amphibians, reptiles, birds, and mammals. But now it's all weird. Yeah. Well, yeah. we're learning so much about the way that, that genes are passed on here lately. It's uh, in the last ten years or so, the way that we're understanding what happened in these early eras and how. Like lichens, mm -hmm. for instance, how they came to exist in the state that they're in now. It's the, the stuff that we're learning is, is incredible the way their genes work yeah yeah absolutely but having so, bacteria involved really helps <laughs> uh, it so does anything, yeah, anything, certainly so anything coming up before we go anything coming up uh, anything coming up anything coming up on either your channels that you want to advertise um couple of collabs probably coming up um then back to the ancestors tale series uh are we are, are we yet how far are we till the till we get to our our first division, to, our first combination with the with the chimps and bonobos? Are we? Good? I think we still have like three videos. Uh, we're, oh. in, we're still we're still in the. We have like the, the the Denisovans tale is next. Then I think it's the Ergaster's tale, oh. then the Handyman's tale, oh, so, then so, Artie's tale. So we have okay. like three. Four, so we're still in the minutes. we're still in the homos. We're not even the the homonymous yet. Yeah, no, we we we're not even in. Yeah, we're not even outside. Have there the, been more Artipithecus stuff since uh, since that was first published? Is that I? I mean, yeah, there's there's been uh, there's like two species of it of Artipithecus now. I think I actually have a book. I got a book not too long ago, which is all about the discovery uh, of Artipithecus. Um, it's titled Fossil Men, but I haven't read it yet because I have. Have so many books as it is so <laughs> you yeah, know how it is <laughs> yeah luckily for us but I, I talked about this with get with erica that our, our branch was more because we were out in the savannah was more had, had got but got more fossilized while the chimp since the, with the, since the chimps and the bonobo branch were over in the forest area less mm -hmm. fossils for them yeah yeah, because yeah, rainforests yeah, yeah, rain are, are not conducive to fossilization. Lots of these kind of creatures crawling around there to uh, to break it down all the way down to the bones. You get uh, isopods yep. and that thrive in that moist environment. Snails. Yeah, yeah. Too bad it wasn't. Too bad it's not like the Carboniferous area where nothing could eat eat the things yet. Like, but after that, we mentioned this. But at, like, like after the Carboniferous, that's when the fungus. Learned how learned how to chop down on the, on plants. Yeah, it is um it is interesting because you have like um, the leaf litter, you know, from forests and things. And don't you even think about it. <laughs> don't you even think about it. Sit down. Um, my cat is preparing to jump onto my chair, on and um, <laughs> and so. Uh, Give me, give me that boy. Ow. And so you have like the leaf litter, you know, in the forest. And so you can see their successive droppings of their branches and stuff. And it's like, it's so well preserved because nothing's breaking these down. So they're just doing this every season, just dropping everything and growing mm -hmm. new branches and dropping those yep. again. And decades so you have these huge. Decades. Yeah, exactly. These huge piles of, of leaf litter. So, yeah. Uh, you can find more early arthropods in there, but you really don't find too many uh, animals among that litter, do you? 
I don't <laughs> think so. Yeah. Yeah, I think the same thing happened. I think I saw a video about how the same thing was happening in North America's leaf litters until the worms came came around the the eat all the, all the dead leaves. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's weird to think that like earthworms are not native to places, like they were introduced. That's really weird to think about. You know. Yeah, some and some places have earthworms that are very very different. Like the na their native earthworms yeah. that fill that niche. Are very different looking than what we have here. There's that but, you know, in South America. There's a tendency towards giantism and yeah. in, in earthworms yeah. in certain areas. When I had uh, cybugs on my channel, she had some pictures of herself yeah. holding earthworms. It was big as as big around as a soda can. It was huge. But it's the same with honeybees. Mm -hmm. Is are honeybees like not really native to America either? No. Yeah, they're honeybees African. These are invasive. Yeah, but they're, we have yeah. European honeybees and African honeybees. And they're detrimental to the environment, but unfortunately they're naturalized now because the native populations cannot support the ecology uh, the, of pollinating all the, because it wasn't just honeybees that were imported. You got to think we also imported a, a whole new array of flora, both domestic and wild that has uh, really taken over our environment as well. But yeah, wasn't the th that was is that why we poured the African bees at first? They're like we wanted to have a better pollination, but then they they're like now nah, nah, we want we want to we want to sting you instead. Yeah, the Africanized honeybees in South America that was a kind of a failed experiment in a way. Uh, they were trying to hybridize them to produce more honey uh, yeah. because the African bees are more industrious but more aggressive, uh, whereas the uh, the European beets are very, very docile in comparison. Uh, and there's different subspecies of those too. But, but I just realized something, you know, with all this, at first, you know, we, we were safe from at least, at least, well, maybe Jackson might be in trouble because he, he's down you know, closer to the, the area, the tropical area. But, but we were, for a while, we were safe for a while because, you know, the, the, the African beets were, were, were uh, uh, what's the word uh, isolated down to the south area where it's more warmer. But now that the climate's getting warmer, maybe they can start spreading up north more. <laughs> then we'll have to like just hide behind the murder hornets and hope they. Uh, oh yeah! Oh yeah! Get out. <laughs> oh, that's true. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. The bees in the Asia, where the murder hornets came from, learned how to learn how to adapt to the murder hornets. But yeah, here, the, 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 the like Japanese oh. honeybees, they have the uh, they they actually cook cook the Asian giant hornets, uh, they all climb on top of it and vibrate and produce all kinds of friction heat. Yeah. And cook that sucker. But over here, the hornets are like, ooh, these guys don't know that trick yet. Pff, time time for lunch. Yeah. So, it, but really, murder hornets only really murdered honeybees, right? Right. Yeah. Uh, they're Asian, yeah, Asian giant hornets are, uh, they're omnivorous. So they like, uh, they do like fruit and stuff, but they will definitely go in and cut off some bee heads and Raid all their honey, eat all their babies, and do all that fun uh, and the, and like stuff. and like lack of bees is is gonna hurt our hurt our produce and stuff. They, they, yeah, they well, then that's the thing about uh, people freaking out about the the Asian giant hornets is it's an agricultural issue. It's not per, uh, public health issue or anything like that. They're not, not they're not murdering humans. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, agricultural. They're gonna affect the uh, the honey. Uh, market and they 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 could potentially affect the agricultural uh, pollination, but we're already struggling with that with bees as it is. So it's uh, they you can't blame that on on the the vespid mandarinia because it's been on downhill slope, and it's mostly because we do homogeneous acres and acres of uh, of crops, and then we want them to pollinate them and bees. They're just like people, they don't want to have uh, a homogenous diet, so they're not going to sit there and, and pollinate the same citrus fruit crops over and over again. They're going to fly around and look for something different to bring home for some variety. And to, and and, yeah, I heard that some some beekeepers transport transport their beehives to for, to certain farms for money to, just to pollinate. Yeah, they get plant. paid to bring their hives to and just put them on a different different pieces of property for a few weeks to let them pollinate the uh, it's, it's citrus is where we're having a lot of problems in southern california uh, and with that isn't there some kind of i heard i don't know if it's true or not anymore but wasn't, for a while wasn't there like some kind of like like bacteria or virus attacking the bees 
Uh, are you talking steroid? about the uh, the hive collapse disorder? Yeah, but, but that's still kind of going on. Um, it's not as mysterious as they make it out to be, Damn. but it's just it's a it's a symptom of the overall insect decline that we're dealing with right now, uh, where we we some areas again down to uh, down eighty percent from the stable insect population that they had in the past. Uh, I believe that uh, the U S is, is somewhere at like 45% of the insect population. So yeah, it's just, it's an overall trend in the, from okay. insects in general. Yeah. I didn't, I didn't know if it was like, if, uh, if we had less diversity of insects now or, or they're they like, maybe, and the more diversity the player, or, or, the key the player way? in hive collapse is uh, is are the mites. Okay. Uh, a, a strain of mites that has uh, found its way. So, okay, that's and that's the thing with the the murder hornets too. With the Asian giant hornets, is you know, we move their natural predators into into their environment, and now they have their natural parasite into the environment. So these aren't these aren't new threats. They're coming and going. Coming yeah. from the, they're being attacked from the inside and being attacked from the outside. Yeah, it was like, uh, oh, they moved here 400 years ago and thrived because their their natural predators weren't around, and now are there in their natural predator parasites weren't around. Now they're just kind of balancing that out, which it's not necessarily a bad thing, but I don't like invasive species because it destroys existing yeah. ecosystems. Yeah, how We've already it, destroyed the existing ecosystem, though. Is it possible, but how or not? How long is it, will it take? A does this ever happen? Can the invasive species ever, ever become naturalized so it's part of the environment, or is it always, will it always be invasive species? Uh, it's, they're, they're, well, they're almost always going to be an invasive. Not almost always. They would always be an invasive species if they were introduced by people. That's all that it matters. If, okay. if the re way that they got to the land mass that they're on uh, is through human influence, whether accidental or on purpose, then they're okay. invasive. Okay. Otherwise, they get there by natural means. It's just... Uh, yeah, just distribution. Okay, like, like maybe they might be invasive at first, but then they may have adapted um, like uh, a few thousand years later. Oh like yeah, they get naturalized or uh, go feral. Uh, pigs and goats and cats and dogs—they all go feral on uh, these isolated islands and become return revert to their naturalized states. Uh, dogs, for instance, have a very distinct naturalized state that's very that's like a like a dingo with maybe a little bit more coloration dingoes are are, are dogs that returned to our domestic dogs that were domesticated by the early uh aboriginal people that eventually went feral and they reverted to that form all dogs will do that eventually uh, within breeding populations pigs do too they go into that uh wild boar looking uh phase yeah. you, you you take uh some your pink farm pigs and put them out in the uh the wild for three or four generations and you got you know basically what looks like a wild boar running around out there yeah i think i think it's i think the most thing probably the if i read the most, one of the most dangerous one was native uh, invasive to australia since most of them are since since uh, the uh the what's it like the placental mammals can override the marsupial right, mammals. yeah between uh between domestic cats foxes uh, domestic dogs, feral horses, uh, but most importantly and most devastatingly is rabbits and uh, rodents, mice and rats, especially mice. Mice right now in Australia, they have a plague. Uh, no joke. So it's all those things are introduced by people and they just devastate the, the ecology down there. There's no, and there's no recovery for that. There's no way back for Australia. We can preserve what we have, um, but there's no going back. Yeah, I know. I, I remember the, the well, I, if you think one time ago before that they're like, they, they brought invasive species over, they're like, oh, let's bring more over. The, we're bringing more to eat the invasive species. That'll solve the problem, but then they, they ate more native species. Yeah, that was a big problem with mongoose when they would introduce uh, rodents to places. They'd be like, oh, well, we'll just bring some mongoose and polecats over to control the rodent population. And they want to, in the, the polecats and the, and the uh, mongoose, though, they're going to go after the easier native species that aren't scared of them before they go after the, 
the rodents that, are, that know what a polecat is, is and want to run away from them. It's like, like, huh? Like, I can eat these things I eat before, but these people aren't running away at all. Huh? Right. Yeah. So easy. Anyway. All right. So before we go, y'all, y'all want to see your ending catchphrases? Oh, uh, be kind and take care. Thanks for watching, and we'll see you next time. Never stop learning and enjoy the randomness. We'll see you then.